Today, the Biden administration colluded with big tech on COVID censorship. Uh, Texas starts shipping immigrants to Chicago, and we get an exclusive interview with a local doctor about the new COVID boosters, which may or may not only be available on Blaze TV, depending on how spicy things get. We'll see how it turns out. We've got all of that and more coming up, but it all starts right now. Welcome to the news and why it matters. I am Sarah Gonzalez. Happy Friday Eve. I am joined today by Stu Berger, host of Stu Does America. I like that Friday Eve is like an optimistic take on Thursday. That's what, I, that's what yeah. I'm trying to do. I'm like trying to keep it right. positive. Mm -hmm. and, but I feel like sometimes people are like, wait, it's, it's Friday? Oh, no, it's just Friday Eve. Oh, so you're actually ruining it for people. I mean... I guess. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that, it guys. It was worth a shot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm doing the best that I can. Uh, also joined by Yaku Buyans, Blaze TV contributor and host of The Bottom Line, which you should be subscribed to both of these gentlemen's channels on YouTube, or at least while they allow us to uh, <laughs> reside over there on YouTube with our scary extremist conservative views. Uh, I want to get into, speaking of scary extremist conservative views, uh, earlier today, a uh, reporter from The Daily Caller tweeted out, according to newly released emails obtained by state attorney generals, Facebook, and the Biden administration apparently arranged weekly and monthly calls to discuss what to censor on their platform. Um, they Obviously, you guys who are watching and not listening on audio, you can see all of the redactions here, but the sender information is redacted. But one email reads, I have been talking about, in addition to our weekly meetings, doing, doing a monthly misinfo slash debunking meeting with maybe topics communicated a few days prior so that you can bring in the matching experts and chat casually for 30 minutes or so. Uh, and then the reply email reads, yes, I'd love that. Uh, all we know so far as of the time of this taping on this is that one account requested to be taken down was a Fauci parody account. So it's, it's a good thing that uh, with all of the craziness with COVID going on and businesses being shut down and people not knowing how they were going to feed their families because they couldn't go to work, it's a really good thing that the White House was actually uh, colluding with big tech to make sure that people couldn't make fun of Dr. Anthony Fauci. That's good. One of the things we did do very well, I think, during the COVID era was to protect Anthony Fauci's self-esteem. It seems to be the main <laughs> so, thing that we were attempting to do. A plus effort. I really, really yeah. did well. We got yeah. to like, cover a bunch of magazines. That was great. Got saws at, you job, got guys. the prayer candles. We did was lots of stuff. Was he man of the year? Man uh, of the year? I, I think he may have been. Uh, yeah, yeah, on something, yeah. Which yeah. is amazing. Uh, you know, Melania Trump never got on the cover no, of a magazine, no, no. but Anthony Fauci on 100 of them, which is fascinating. Uh, yeah, I mean, like... <laughs> A parody account is a great example of the idiocy that this, you know, this has, you know, has been experienced by all of us, I think, as we've gone through watching this go, every, the world go crazy. Um, there's no reason for, in fact, I would say it's fundamentally, at least in spirit against the Constitution. Mm -hmm. We've talked about, like, mm -hmm. the First Amendment. You know, I don't think that a, if Facebook is sitting there on their own deciding to censor their platform, I think that's wrong and they shouldn't do it. That's yeah. not a First Amendment violation. Right. You know, the First Amendment pretty strictly is Congress shall pass no law. And I guess in this case, they didn't pass a law, but it's the federal government acting to censor these uh, these particular mediums. Mm -hmm. And if that's not a First Amendment violation, man, it's really close. The only reason they just don't pass laws anymore. Now the executive branch seems to just do everything without Congress. Right. So I guess that's like a double constitutional violation. Uh, it's a real problem. And th they shouldn't be involved in this. I, I watched the, um, the Zuckerberg interview with, uh, with Joe, Joe Rogan. Rogan yeah. And yeah. I, I tried to watch not just the clip that kind of got passed along yes, yes. and watch a good chunk of it around there. The Joe Rogan interviews are really long, so I'll be I honest, I didn't listen to the them. whole thing. They're like three hours yeah. long. So I, but I could listen to about an hour of it yeah. or surrounding that comment. And it was interesting because, like, you do get the sense, and I, I don't know, everyone says Zuckerberg's just a, a drone and a, and a, a, a robot of yeah. some sort. He didn't really come off that badly, I didn't think, in the interview. And at times, I felt like you could see this, like, defeatism in him where he just he he is we always think of the pressure that's coming from our side on this stuff right like why are you canceling these people why are you censoring we often forget that all of his friends are doing the exact opposite yeah. including Absolutely. people in the government yeah. yes no so question i think maybe the expectations in, yeah the expectations are that yeah. so i think like maybe there's a part of zuckerberg that would 
not because he doesn't he wants to keep the same material on Facebook that we do. That's not what he's thinking of. But I think he'd like to be out of this business. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's a part of him that would love to be like, I don't want to make any of these decisions. I don't want to get in the middle of this. I'm sick of dealing with it. But he's constantly pressured by government officials. And, you know, even when they, you know, they come to your door, whether they have guns or not, you kind of feel the pressure of like, I better do what these people say. And a lot of times these places fold. A lot of times it's because they're aligned politically as well, of course, as we know with Hunter Biden and some other things. But like, this has got to stop. The government cannot be involved in this. This is absolutely the opposite of what the government should be doing, especially when it comes to a parody account. Right. Yeah, yeah. no, look, I'll say this is the prime example. And to your point, I love the point you're making, but this is the prime example why Section 230 should be so contested mm -hmm. because the government has overreached forever but they've allowed liberty to these platforms but they will also call the favors to mm -hmm. we've allowed you to grow to a hundred and fifty three hundred billion dollar company so now you're going to dance and I agree with you if he could flip a switch and just disappear <laughs> he would do it today. That's why yeah. Dorsey was so willing to exit mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah, Twitter. That's true. These guys want out because the pressure from the other side, because they sold their soul. And look, at, at the end of the day, at some point they're human. And yes, I think innately Zuckerberg is, is corrupt, but I'm with you, the pressure. Yeah. But this is such an overreach. This makes the point. This parody example makes the point that Twitter, Facebook, Instagram have become extensions of the federal government. They might as well be federal employees at this point. They are... Media outlets who do a better job than the press secretary in the White House, I'll tell you that much, sure. okay? It's they are media hurdle. outlets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're media outlets that further extend the narrative mm -hmm. and perpetuate it. And they have been doing this for a long time, and it's got to stop. So the true evildoer here, we get back to the federal government. And unfortunately there could be both sides of the aisle sometimes, but predominantly the left. So the federal overreach into our social conversation been coming a long time and it's got to stop but unless we fundamentally stop it with law re-looking at some of the liberties these guys have if facebook had to operate like blaze tv okay as a publisher as a commentator and they do they they give commentary and they pick winners and losers it would be a completely different world but they're not they protect it under section 230 there's things they can get away with that we could never mm. uh, never get away with here or the wire or anybody else for that matter but they're protected not really if you really look at the law but they extend them the grace because it's favoritism it's favors it's backroom deals and then comes the pressure so yeah it's got to stop yeah and i you know i often grapple with people are so quick whenever social media uh you know there's censorship in social media obviously of a conservative and people throw up their arms and they say this is a violation of the first amendment and you're like i mean no, because it's not the government, but right. yeah. you hear stories like this and you're like, kind of is. Yeah, now it is. It is. Now we have reached that territory, yeah. uh, in my opinion. Um, I want to switch over to um, more, you know, good news abounds uh, in 2022 here. Yesterday, researchers at Goldman Sachs released a paper titled The Housing Downturn further to fall. Uh, they now forecast that activity in the United States housing market will uh, will end 2022 down across the board, and they are projecting a 22% drop this year in new home sales, a 17% drop in existing home sales, and an 8.9% drop in housing GDP. By the way, just for some perspective here, uh, Russia's economy is only expected to see GDP fall 3% this year, and they are in the middle of, um, I don't know if you guys have heard, but it, there's a pretty big conflict going on. Really? Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. We should cover that maybe later in the show. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that's, yeah. Yeah. That's so, Break, breaking news. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> amazing. I mean, this is scary. Yeah. And I think, you know, I can understand trying to buy an election by giving away hundreds of billions of dollars in student loans and all these other things. But like, you're not going to be able to buy your way out of that problem mm -hmm. if that's the way that this looks in a couple of years, mm -hmm. if this is right. Um, you go back and look at the, the Case-Shiller Index, which is an index that covers housing prices across the country. Yeah. Uh, hung around 100 for a million years, really, the entire time. Hung around 100. Around the 2008 uh, cycle, I think it went up to 140. And then we had the housing collapse. We came back down. Uh, well, it never came back down to 100. Never got back to the normal levels. Went back to around, I think it was like 120. 120 yeah. And now we're at something like 160. Yeah. Uh, worse than the 2008 yeah. crisis. Uh, yeah. You see the same thing. The, the guy from The Big Short, uh, who is famously called the housing crisis, is saying, we're here again, mm -hmm. and it's going to be worse. Mm -hmm. 
you know, he's a Dallas guy. He's a friend. He's he was very smart. Yeah, but, very smart. Very smart. But, but I think Stu, this is not. I don't see this as a as a. You hear me on this on the housing as a downturn. It's a correction because mm-hmm. there's yeah. been a mm-hmm. insane inflation in home prices. Twenty five percent. So if you look. 25% home prices inflated, and all of a sudden now it's correcting back to 20. It's kind of where it should be. I mean, ha- the housing prices are insane. And I like it if you have equity in the house, and that's great. But you sell that house, you've got to go, you you gotta go buy somewhere something else. Yeah. else. Yeah. Somewhere else. And you yeah. can't get the same, the same value. So this was to be expected. The I hilarious mean, part of this is like when you go to your own house on Zillow, and you're just like, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it can't be real, can it? Yeah. And it's like, it looks great right well, now. Not. But, yeah. you know, but, but, as you point out, every time you sell a house, you've got to buy it somewhere else. And, right. you know, it doesn't always work out so well. <laughs> and you're usually trying to get something bigger, right? This is America. We're trying to get something bigger. Right. We're trying to upgrade a little right. bit. Right, right. And uh, well, usually least, that's At least comparable. There. But, I mean, this is 08. This is Fannie, Freddie, the whole deal again. It's a house, housing what they would call a housing collapse, but it's been so hyperinflated. And this is where, in a way, I like to see what the guys like BlackRock is doing because they were partially responsible. They came into uh, markets like Dallas and told realtors, look, we'll pay, we'll pay 20%, you know, right off the spot, just offer 20% over market. And then you have people, you know, you have 150, 155 offers on a house and the house sells 20% over market. That's not sustainable, Stu. It can't. There's no, there's no way that, that you can keep growing at that rate. So it had to correct. Um, I actually think uh, for those who are in a position to buy stuff, April next year, you're going to be able to pick up some bargains. Uh, mm. A lot of guys are going to get very wealthy. It just seems like it's everywhere. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah. you know, I put, I help, was helping a relative put their house on the market, and you know, the re- realtor gave us a price. And we said, I don't know. I mean, the market's up. Like, let's go a little higher than that. So I can't remember what the number was, like ten or $15,000 over that first day sold for the full price. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, you know, that's not, that's not how houses are supposed to sell. That's not <laughs> realistic. Yeah. Um, and I don't, you know, there's a lot of things that go into the causes of that. But at some point, I think we all realize we're going to be paying some sort of price for what the last couple of years have been like. And, you know, you throw six, seven, eight trillion dollars at people yes. over a period of two years. Something's going to happen. You yeah. can't just do that. No. Yeah. No. Um, uh, on the topic of housing, uh, Bank of America is now offering first-time home buyers in. This is just a select group of cities. We'll mm-hmm. get into how they determined the group of cities in a moment. But uh, this is going to be zero down payment, zero closing cost mortgages to help grow home ownership among Black and Hispanic Latino communities. So they're not going to require mortgage in- insurance and um, no minimum credit score, but eligibility will be based on factors like timely rent payments and on-time utility bill, phone and auto insurance payments. And uh, this is first going to become available in neighborhoods uh, like Charlotte, Dallas, Detroit, Los Angeles, and Miami. I do want to point out that you don't have to actually be black or Hispanic or Latino to qualify for the product, but they are, they said, like in their statement, they said, our community affordable loan solution will help make the dream of sustained home ownership attainable for more black and Hispanic families, and it is part of our broader commitment to the communities that we serve. So they're like, if you live in that community and you're not a minority, you can still apply but our purpose for doing that, our intended purpose, is to help minorities, um, you know, become eligible for all of these things. What hmm. are your thoughts on that? Interesting, because that's kind of they're back. They're ba- the initial reporting was it was just for blacks and right. Hispanics. It's, I mean, this is how they're getting around the legal issues here mm-hmm. because you can't right. just give. You know, right. I was, not offer it to white people. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, that's not how this works. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. this is <laughs> hello from South Africa. Yeah. Com- yeah. This is an affirmative action program. I know they say, Stu, you can apply. Mm-hmm. That means nothing. Will they approve it? Right. Well, I mean, mm-hmm. again, it goes back to the cities yeah. that they're offering it in. It's around the, a legal, it's the around intended a legal, yeah. purpose. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And look, uh, I, I think there's a uh, we do a little bit too much of home ownership worship in this country. Mm-hmm. Yes. We're like, yes. Not, look, you know, that's not all. The, uh, home ownership a lot of times kind of sucks. I, you know, <laughs> I got to say, I've, I've had to fix me a lot of big repairs in my house, and it was a lot of times I property wish tax. I was renting and, yeah. and not paying. Pro- oh, in my Dallas, God, here, property, property tax in Dallas is insane. It's not necessarily for everybody, and. Especially someone who can't come up with any down payment and needs a zero percent interest rate, maybe that's not the right person mm-hmm. to have to be in home ownership. It doesn't. You know, it's not. A, it's not a requirement to be a citizen. But beyond that, I think like we know back in history there were 
banks who did these types of mm-hmm. things. They just only gave uh, their loans to white people. And I thought we came together to criticize that. Yeah. Like, I thought we all thought that was really terrible. Yeah. Um, and they used to usually hit it because they didn't want anyone to know. And then we might find out in a court case that they were doing that or something. You know, back this is going back many, many yes. years now. Yes. Uh, th- th- now it's explicit. Like, they're just coming out and saying, we want certain races to get benefits that other races don't. Now, I know they're saying that you can still apply. Maybe that's true. Loophole. We'll see. Yeah. But, like, the bottom line is, like, that used to be something, as Americans, we were embarrassed about. Our country was supposed to be a place where everyone was put on the same plane, mm-hmm. that everyone got the same opportunities, regardless of skin color. Uh, we failed uh, quite famously early on in many aspects of that. We failed with gender uh, into, for way too long. We know that those things went on, but the point was to get to a place where everyone had the same opportunity, not the same outcome. And, of course, now they're trying to do this this equity, equality game and remix the whole country. I don't want it. Most people I know uh, don't want it, life, but yeah. the left is attempting it anyway. Yeah, yeah life, life just doesn't work that way, Stu. It's just, it's, it just doesn't. You can't all things equal to all people. It just doesn't work that way. Opportunity, equal opportunity, mm-hmm. yes. But this is no question. This is a program. If you look at the cities listed, yeah. and I would argue this, and put, and put a map over what's going to happen in November where some of the most contested races on a local level is going to happen, like the Dallas County race, for Dallas County judge, I would argue those cities are very, very selectively, uh, uh, you know, profiled mm. by again propping up a vote, mm-hmm. buying a vote by just pay attention. We're bringing something to you. I would argue very few Caucasians get qualified for this program. Yeah, well, we uh, will certainly keep an eye on it. Um, we do want to. Uh, Take a minute to thank our sponsor, Healthy Cell. So I use Healthy Cell in my house. Everyone in my family uses Healthy Cell. So Healthy Cell is, it's a, they've got a bunch of supplements. You gotta go on their website and, and check it out. They've got like a, one for focus. They've got one for sleep. They've got a regular multivitamin that you would take uh, every day, which I love and take every day. But um, it's gonna be an, a gel packet that you can just pop back in your mouth, mix it in whatever you want to if you want. But it gives you like, Uh, what, 165% more absorption than any sort of supplement pills you're taking. So you're not getting the intended results unless you are using Healthy Cell, and it tastes great. Kids will love it. Everyone loves it. Like I said, I use the the multivitamin every day. My husband uses the the REM sleep as well. Um, I've used that. It really works, and you're getting the promised results. You can go to healthycell.com slash news. They've got something for everyone over at healthycell.com dot com slash news use promo code news for 20 percent off of your order over at healthycell.com slash news uh yesterday we discussed the new covid booster shots that were approved um well there was some, there was some testing i mean it there wasn't any human testing but they did test it in mice so we we know it's fine i mean they only tested it in eight mice um but we're pretty sure that it's fine. <laughs> What's but, the right number of mice to test it on? Is it like 12? It 13? apparently okay. is eight. Oh, it's eight. Oh, it's, eight. it's enough. It's eight, eight is the What's magic your number? number? Is, it tw- is, it, is it nine? Would I you mean, go I, nine if you could? I actually <laughs> would prefer the human. Oh, wow. Route. Wow, that's, you're totally I know. It's cra- crazy. Put the tinfoil hat on me. But um, last week, Rochelle Walensky was asked on uh, Conversations on Healthcare radio show about the criticism from like all of these scientists and doctors who are saying uh, maybe the boosters are being rushed. Maybe we should wait and get some... I don't know, human data before we start injecting everyone with it. And she said, no, 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 it actually could be worse if we wait for the actual scientific data. Watch. These booster uh, shots for the fall, the data that um, we are looking at is related to very, very small changes in the mRNA sequence um, and really shouldn't impact safety at all. Um, We're not expecting it will impact safety. There's there's always a question here of being too slow versus too fast. Um, And I think one of the challenges is if we wait for those data to emerge in human data, not just mice data and human data, um, we will be using what I would consider to be a potentially outdated vaccine. Um, And maybe it's best, and I believe it is best, to use a vaccine that's tailored for the variant that we have right now. Now they always say, trust the experts, right? That's what we are supposed to do. So I figured we would bring in an, an expert an actual doctor 
to talk to us about this because I do have some questions. I'd like to welcome to the program uh, author and physician, Dr. Mark Huffman. Glad that you could uh, you could make it. Great to be here. And so am I off base in saying um, perhaps there might be some weird unintended consequences of not studying this in actual people? If you don't think that that will happen, you haven't been paying very much attention over the last two years. Mm -hmm. So what, what, have you seen this ever at all happen previously in any sort of, not just vaccines, but like medicine in general? These two years are <laughs> unprecedented in medicine. Yeah. Now I will say medicine is replete with, in retrospect, hilarious expert consensus. By the way, expert consensus means that there's no actual data. Mm -hmm. A bunch of people got into a room and they said, this is our best guess. Right. Mm -hmm. okay, that's, that's what expert consensus is medicine is. Yeah. It, but I mean, go back all the way to heroin. Uh, heroin is a brand name. Um, that's a fun fact, by the way. That's an anesthesia fact, like Jello yeah. or Kleenex. Oh, yeah, is a brand yeah. name. Huh. Um, huh. And everyone thought that it was going to be a less addictive. Uh, and by everyone, I mean all doctors, physicians. Yeah. Um, they thought it was going to be a less addictive alternative to morphine. That work, didn't work out. Mm -hmm. uh, the history of medicine is, again, replete with doctors thinking one thing. And then in retrospect, it being hilariously wrong. Like, smoke, it's great for you. You just go on and <laughs> on and on. Definitely do it when you're pregnant. Uh, but, but there's this strange phenomenon where I think the public and honestly doctors themselves convince themselves that this time we're all right. This time we got it. Mm -hmm. Like two years ago, memory hold that, mm -hmm. okay? I mean, even at the beginning, Jerome Adams, who was Surgeon General under, under Trump, uh, he went flipping from masks, you don't need them. You don't need them. Six weeks later, you gotta wear masks all the time. We love masks, we love masks. And honestly, one of my first red flags as a physician, and I'm not in academics, I don't do research, I'm just a regular. Which is why we know we can trust you. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> appreciate that. But it's, but it's also why we say we practice medicine. Yeah, yeah. We practice medicine. Yeah, one day we're gonna get good enough to actually do it. Yeah, <laughs> but practice you know, medicine. We're yeah. doing our best. Yeah. What's the worst that could happen is what yeah. I've, feel like. So, so what was the red flag? So the red flag is, I, I'm looking at Jerome Adams. Now, I, I'm on social media, but not as a physician, because that's extraordinarily boring. <laughs> uh, but I follow Jerome Adams. He's an anesthesiologist. He was Trump's Surgeon General. Mm -hmm. And I asked him in my regular civilian, semi-anonymous Twitter guys, what made you flip? Not busting his chops from the left because he's Trump's Surgeon General. Not busting his chops from the right because now he's saying, mass, 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 mm -hmm. authoritarian government, mm -hmm. whatever. Just as a physician, personally, I want to know what made you flip. And his answer was to link me to a CDC study where it was a couple of uh, hairdressers who wore masks and a hundred something right. clients. Mm -hmm. And he links it to me like it's dispositive, like it's a good study, uh, which to, to a layman, it's a, it's a CDC study. Right. And I'm looking at it, this is barely anecdotal. You can't make any conclusion based on this. You can barely craft a study, a real study based on this, mm -hmm. but you're not talking about just making recommendations. You're talking about legislation. Mm -hmm. You're talking about taking punitive action for people who don't do that. Based on this, this is your fastball. Mm -hmm. This is your best shot. So I knew that he knew the value of that. And I knew that he knew the value of that was minuscule. Right. It wasn't mm -hmm. any good, but he's presenting it to the public, mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. on Twitter, like, hey, this is, here you see, go. it's fine. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, wait, okay, <laughs> I know he's lying, right? but I don't know why. Later on, I, I see him talk about, as an anesthesiologist, just on one of his little Twitter threads, as an anesthesiologist, I wear a mask in the OR to protect my patients. And I was like, my man, <laughs> there's never been a moment you wear a mask in the operating room to protect your patient. That's never entered into your mind. Mm. You wear it because the AOR and the Association of OR Nurses says it's a good idea by virtue of you being who you are. I know that you know that factors contributing to OR sterility have been studied and that masks aren't one. Mm. They're not. And you also wear it so you don't get spit in your mouth. Is that gross? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. rare. Yeah. It's, you don't wear a mask. Right. Um, <laughs> but it, so why are you saying that? Yeah. Why are yeah. you presenting it like that? Yeah. So I started being extremely cynical even more than I normally am as a physician. Yeah. Um, 
And, and I, I still don't have those answers. It's fascinating because we were, I think, appropriately uh, critical of Russia for mm -hmm. releasing their vaccine before they went through stage three trials. Mm -hmm. Now we're not going through any stage trials on this ex yeah. except well, for mice. You are the trial. Right. Yeah. So Congratulations. I think that's a really important point for everyone that's to understand right. is not that these drugs will not have human trials. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They will. They will. Mm -hmm. it's, it's you in two days. Yeah. And you volunteered for it, which is fine if you know that's what you're doing. If you know that you were signing up for a human clinical trial, okay, mm -hmm. by, that's choice. Fine. Mm -hmm. by choice, by choice, by mm -hmm. choice. But but being gaslit, not by coercion, exactly. Mm -hmm. And even if it's not, you know, strict gun to your head coercion. Oh, it's 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 more lethal than that. It's, if it was a gun to the head, it would be evident, and we could resist with the same force. But coercion, in its purest form, you coerce someone to do something they don't even know they're being coerced. That is a tactic yeah. of specific evil. Because I think, like, you know, it's interesting because, uh, like, if there, there's a new Mountain Dew flavor that just came out. Uh, Mountain God, of, course of course you, you know would, this. Of course you would bring it up to I just, I just had some. It is was it, delicious. Oh, is it cool Are you ranch? sponsored? No, no, it's not Cool Ranch. Okay. Um, it's, uh, it was Spark. <laughs> Uh, Mountain Dew Spark, and it's uh, Mountain Dew plus uh, raspberry lemonade. It's okay. freaking delicious. But, like, that I wouldn't want to put that on the market without humans trying it for safety. Right. Like, like this right. is like, a, I mean, everything in me would believe mixing raspberry lemonade and Mountain Dew should be fine. People should be able to live through that. Uh, maybe not as long. <laughs> but I promise uh, they should there were focus groups on but that. There were, I promise I'm you. I'm sure there were. Absolutely it's there just, were it's, it's a very strange process, especially, you know, like now, right? Like, if, if you were to say in... I don't know, April 2020, and say, hey, we got a vaccine. We haven't really been able to try it on anybody yet. Anyone want to give it a whirl? You would have had hands up all over the place, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that we're through these two years, we're at a point where we're down deaths from the worst numbers by 70, 80, 90 percent, and now they'd be introducing something without try. Like, what sense does that make? That does not make any sense at all. But also at an expedited timeline. She's yeah. pressing. Why? Because there's more to come. Mm -hmm. Look, we fed the monster called Big Pharma, and that thing's thirsty. So then, yeah, it likes gotta, let, oh, then let, it let me ask you this then, doctor, <laughs> before we go to before we have to to go to break and and let you go here. How concerned should Americans be about the lack of informed consent on this particular uh, drug? Uh, I think I would approach a lot of what you hear from, quote unquote, experts, which uh, let me tell you, there are no experts in a novel disease. Mm -hmm. There are no experts in a drug that's being put forward through an emergency use authorization. Where's the emergency? Mm. I don't know. I don't know. It's like this perpetual emergency that just lets us, it gives us carte blanche to do everything. Um, I would be really, really dubious. I'm not saying don't trust the medical establishment, but I'm moving that way and I'm in it. <laughs> and it's been really disheartening <laughs> because I need people to trust me right. on a regular basis. Mm -hmm with literally their lives. And when I see these guys doing things that I know are so irresponsible, uh, from calling it a vaccine where you should call it a therapeutic, mm -hmm. that's right. That's not mm -hmm. wrong mm -hmm. if you just say, well, it decreases hospitalization and death in this population. Why don't you just say that? Mm. So I, I'd, I'd approach it with, uh, with some caution. Yeah. I think that's the right thing to do based on these last couple of years. And I'm afraid that it's the credibility that we have lost as physicians and as the medical establishment, we will not regain within my career. Mm. And, and that is going to be, who knows what that's going to mean down the road. Yeah. And that's what these guys are doing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I could not agree more. But we appreciate you being in the mix and involved and willing to, to speak out about it um, because you are one of the rare few that we can trust, so we appreciate it. I try. Yeah. <laughs> My pleasure. Um, uh, well, thanks for joining us, yeah. and we, can we come back? I'll come back. Come back, back to the program? Yeah, okay, great. Back. Great! Yay! Um, all right, thank you for joining us. We want to take another quick moment to thank our sponsor, Backbone One. So I actually, I, I let Stu use my Backbone One because, as it turns out, he has way more time to use it. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, that makes me sound like I've just got big open windows. But actually, I think the Backbone thing, which is a, it's a controller for your phone that yes. helps helps you play any game on your phone. Yes. You let me uh, do it. And one of the big things about, I used to love playing video games back in the day, mm -hmm. but now I have kids and I never get up to turn the thing on. This thing's amazing. <laughs> you freaking connect it to your phone and you can play your actual like PlayStation that's up in the room that you never turn on. Yeah. It literally is playing the games on that in real time. It feels exactly like you're playing 
uh, a full PlayStation game, but it's like it's a uh, it's turned into a mobile unit, and you can do it on the go, and you can do it on the go wherever yeah. you are. So like, am I going to go upstairs and turn the TV on and get all the hookups? I probably have it hooked up wrong or whatever. <laughs> no, but am I sitting on my couch? I've got like 20 minutes to kill, and I can pull out the the backbone and, yeah. and play a game that feels like a real game. It's not like a dumb phone game. It feels right. like you're really playing the full the full Xbox or PlayStation or whatever. It's in, actually legitimately incredible. I yeah. cannot believe it. Yeah, it, I mean, it turns your phone into the controller. So, uh, it, look, if you're like Stu and you want to play, mm -hmm. but you don't have the time um, to go up and boot it up and, and you could do it on the go, you got to go to playbackbone.com slash news. You can order your backbone for a limited time. Get free access to over 350 console games and perks. So you got to go there. It is playbackbone.com slash news. Yesterday, two buses carrying an estimated 80 to 100 migrants from Texas arrived in Chicago now. This is the first one to arrive in Chicago. Many of them, by the way, uh, people always think like these are just these are people from Mexico. No, oftentimes they are not from Mexico. Uh, most of them said that they were from Venezuela in this particular migrant, Im illegal immigrant drop off. And uh, Greg Abbott said in a statement that... <laughs> This trolling is so good. He looks forward to seeing Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot welcome the migrants since Chicago is a sanctuary city. He said to continue providing much needed relief to our small overrun border towns, Chicago will join fellow sanctuary cities, Washington, D.C. and New York City as an additional drop off location. Uh, Mayor Lightfoot loves to tout the responsibility of her city to welcome all regardless of legal status. And I look forward to seeing this responsibility in action as these migrants receive resources from a sanctuary city with the capacity to serve them. And of course, Mayor uh, Lori Lightfoot was like, this is racist. So did she act, did, how, what, I thought I read a response from her where she kind of said we are a welcoming city and we will blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So she so, said Chicago welcomes. Yeah, okay. uh, she said Chicago welcomes hundreds of migrants every year to our city and provides much needed assistance. Unfortunately, Texas Governor Greg Abbott is without any shame or humanity. But ever since he put these racist practices of expulsion in place, we have been working with our community partners to, to ready the city to receive these individuals. We'll see how long that lasts. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, look, the the. the Speaking just politics, the dumbest thing you can do is criticize Greg Abbott for this. Yeah. What you what you should do as a Democrat mayor is say, please, thank God, please, please send them bring here, them get here. them out of Texas, mm -hmm. that evil, terrible place, mm -hmm. bring them here so we can help take care of them. That should be your attitude politically. All these mayors are falling for this. I thought Larry, Larry Lightfoot, at least in, Larry Lightfoot initially walked that line a little bit better, but that statement's just as terrible as the other mayors. Um, uh, this that That's just absolutely fascinating. And of course, like, that should be their stance, right? If they're honest, yeah. right? If they were honest, they would mm -hmm. say, of course, bring them here. We, we are saying we're a sanctuary. We are saying we will take care of them. We are saying you in Texas, you're racist and you don't want to take care of them. So why wouldn't they open their arms with, with this big embrace? I don't, yeah. I don't know why this, this is so difficult for them. This is not, you know, it's funny, too, because I listened to some um, pretty extensive reporting on this, when it was, especially when it was first happening. And what was interesting is even the, the mainstream reporters talking to the migrants as they're getting off the bus and as they were getting onto the bus said, universally, these people were excited about it mm -hmm. because their plan was to go up there anyway. Yeah. Right. And they just got a free ride. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so it works yeah. for Greg Abbott politically. But. It does not. It's not racist. It's not a expulsion. The people. It was all optional. They all could go if they wanted to go, and many of them were actually. They couldn't even come up with the fake story of oh, this person was crushed. They wanted to stay in Texas, and now they had to go to Washington D.C. They're like, no, they wanted to go up there anyway. So they, they went signed for a free. consent form. They signed a consent form, they, which, by the way, is written in in Spanish as well. Because so some nice. people would yeah. say like, well, it's in English, and they don't know what they're signing. No, it's written no. in both. I read it. It's yeah. actually. Amazing. If you guys have you guys read it? I haven't read yep. the whole thing. It's no. so good. It it's is? oh, it's so good. It's like, well, here are your options. You can go to it was the one that had DC and New York City, and it's like Washington DC, where you can be uh, closer, and uh, the Congress people who are like with these policies letting you in are much more accessible. So you should probably <laughs> go there where they can help you. Same thing for New York City is great. No, it was great. Look, it, because it's all optics, dude. Yeah. yeah. It's all optics. It's all political theater. This is no different than George Clooney saying we should take in migrants, but he's got a 40-foot hedge with armed guards around his house yeah. and the Second Amendment is evil. This is, it's all optics until you call him on it. And I say call him on it. But remember, evil can't turn on itself. 
So they're so all in that they don't even have the wherewithal to play good politics in this and go, you know what, don't give Abbott a win here. Let's just say, yes, thank mm -hmm. you very much. We'll do what you won't do. They can't do it yeah. because mm -hmm. they're so blind to their own deceit and lies and what they're in. They, they don't know up from down. So, yes, let's double down on this. I mean, this Two is, buses is not enough. Right. Yeah. No, yeah. It's, it's funny. Send them. And this is the greatest thing that could have happened to Greg Abbott. I mean, like, there's a lot of, you know, you could argue it's a political stunt at some level. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not going to solve the whole problem. Right. Maybe it helps a little bit around yeah. the edges on some yeah. of these places. But, but it like, makes a point. It, it makes a That's, really good point. And, you know, Abbott, who is, you know, uh, going to beat Beto O'Rourke, I think, uh, but also is in an election period where mm -hmm. he's not. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, not, we better make sure he yes. beats. Yeah. He Beto only beats Beto if you, if guys you go, go out to vote. The polls. Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing with Abbott. There. He's not like DeSantis, where there's a lot of re Republican passion for right, him. Exactly. They definitely Which prefer him. The yeah. state prefers sure. him over over Beto. Yes. But there's not like you know an undying loyalty to Greg Abbott. This is really he needed something to help yeah. activate his base. And this has been, I think, honestly, a really good play. It's it's worked out better than he possibly could have imagined because of how dumb the Democratic mayors have been with it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I totally agree with you, and I think that you put it very well. That like no one's passionate about Greg Abbott. Yeah. Like I don't. No one has Greg Abbott signs in their front yard. However, on the other side, it is a cult following mm -hmm. that Robert Francis O'Rourke has. So, Luckily, it's not big enough, hopefully, to, to win an as election. As long as everyone yeah. goes and votes is all I'm Do saying. Do not, for the love of Texas, for one second think this is a shoe-in. you got to play, mm -hmm. play this thing like we're behind, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Guys, you I, have to. I'm in... I'm, yeah. I filed a federal lawsuit against his campaign. He cannot be the governor. That would be very awkward for me. So please make move. sure. For the sake of Sarah, yes. Yes. you for the go sake there. of Sarah, yes. please yes. don't do that. Uh, all right, we got to take a, a quick break. We'll be right back. No, Nashville's beautiful. You'll like it there. You'll like it there. <laughs> it's beautiful. They've got all the nice morning. Uh, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, also referred to as the, this is the nation's report card is what they usually call them. They released their report on tests administered to nine-year-old students nationwide this week. Uh, apparently, average scores for age nine students in 2022 declined five points in reading, seven points in mathematics compared to 2020. And by the way, this is, you may be thinking like, oh, it's all, only five and seven points. That's good, right? We're doing okay. No, this is actually the largest average score decline in reading uh, since 1990 and the first ever score decline in mathematics. Uh, black students, by the way, were impacted more severely in math scores in comparison with white students. Reading scores dropped less in the comparison between pre-pandemic and post-pandemic assessments, but a decline was still detected. And um, I mean, listen, the American Rescue Plan spent, what, how, uh, $122 billion that was earmarked for K through 12 schools. Um, <laughs> record level federal spending for our schools and somehow they still can't get it right and our children, well, I would say that they're learning nothing in schools, but they are learning um, <laughs> how to become gender fluid. Mm. So, Sarah, you know last week where I was in this, this, yes. this past Monday and Tuesday, I testified in, in the Texas State School, School Board of Education. Texas right now, and this is, look, this is one of those things where I just cringe when I have to say this, but we rank 43rd. It's bad. Out of 50. Okay, the education in this country is so dismal, the crap they're wanting to feed your children. You know, now in Texas, what was proposed is studying the 28 genders. Who decided that it was 28? I thought it was, I thought like it was 90 like, something. Yeah, no, no, I thought no. we were no, in they're the now gonna, No, but they want them to study 28. Pulling out Moses, pulling out, you know, the Alamo, pulling out, you know, things like Davy Crockett, Lincoln, JFK, but teaching Chinese dynasty and these kind of, it's insane. And the results, that's the result. Mm -hmm. Our country is falling behind while China is rising. Other nations are rising. Our, our nation is getting dumber and dumber by design. This is by design, yeah. 100%. This is not by some happenstance or accident, right? What did O'Rourke say? No child will stress again recently. Yeah. We're gonna get rid of the star testing in Texas. Completely eliminate it. And no more standardized testing because we just will not have children stress over a test again. That's where we're going with the, this leftist radical movement in this country. Yeah, I mean, I like that you pointed out how bad it's gotten for Texas, but I do, and, and I nationwide. think- nationwide. That's the problem is it's that nationwide. even if you look at nationwide, yeah. 
we are behind uh, a lot of other countries, and I, gee, I wonder if the Department of Education has anything to do with that. Yeah, it's so bizarre that uh, it seemed like there were several people that I know who were predicting that this would be a problem when really? you take kids out of school for hmm. a year, year and a half, two years. Maybe there'd be some consequences to you that. Think? Yeah, I'm, hmm. I'm pretty pretty convinced of it. Yeah, and it's funny because it, you know the, the the New York Times wrote a big story about this study today, and 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 where they they the wording of it was always like they we lost this education because of the pandemic, and it's like no, that's not that's not what happened. Here. <laughs> that's not what happened. The yeah. policies yeah. related to the pandemic yeah. that were unnecessary mm -hmm. policies that were, did not do any good, that not affect, did not positively affect uh, our, you know, the kids' health in any uh, real way was mainly drawn or uh, driven by teachers' unions who didn't seem to want to go back to work. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, that is really the problem. The, even the, look, you know, we, we sometimes are critical of uh, you know, uh, the scientific establishment at times, uh, which is, you know, you should be skeptical of everything. But uh, besides, I mean, the, one, literally one of the first interviews I, I remember listening when the pandemic was just starting, this has got to be early March, late February, something like that, and it was Joe Rogan. Uh, mm -hmm. He was talking to uh, Michael Osterholm, who was a, you know, an infectious disease expert, who wound up later being an, an advisor to Joe Biden. Okay, and and Joe Rogan, you know, this is early in the pandemic. No one knows what's going on yet. And he's like, I mean, what are they going to do if this is really serious? The first thing they're going to do is close the schools, right? And Osterholm went on this long rant about, actually, no, that's probably not something we want to do. Closing the schools is the last thing we want to do because, number one, you're not going to allow nurses and doctors are not going to be able to go to work because they're going to have to stay home mm -hmm. with, with their kids. Yeah. And it, it does not look like this is affecting kids in this way. It was literally the, one of the first things I heard about COVID-19 that I can actually remember. It was known from the beginning. European countries did it the right way in most cases where they were much, mm -hmm. they, held, they handled it totally differently. They yeah. were not masking two-year-olds. In, in Europe, yeah. uh, they acted as if this was some like crazy right wing Texas thing. It was consistent with the science from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And as someone you know who, who doesn't have their kids kids in public schools, you notice the difference. Yep. You yep. notice yep. that they yep. went yep. to you know, with the exception of immediately when it happened, they you know they they did close the schools like everybody did, but they were back there very quickly. And you notice the difference. They didn't miss a beat. Yep. And I think I'm, I'm, we've created a two tier society here where kids are going to be spending the rest of their lives trying to make up for these terrible. Yeah, policies. I was yes. about to say yep. that the ramifications will not be measured for the next decade. Mm -hmm. it, it, yeah. it will not. Yeah. This is the, the collateral damage is severe. And by the way. Um, don't forget that. Don't forget who did that to your children. Uh, we got to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Uh, during a roundtable on women's reproductive health, Nancy Pelosi, who, of course, says she's a Catholic, uh, repeatedly said abortion restrictions are sinful. She said... Uh, but one word that pervades through all of the discussion was the word justice. The fact that this is such an assault on women of color and women, lower income families, is, is just sinful. <laughs> it's sinful. It's wrong that they would be able to say women what they think women should be doing with their lives and their bodies. It's sinful. The injustice of it all is sinful. It's sinful to... I'm sorry, could we just point out, we actually are the, we are the ones who want women of color to actually live and not be killed in the womb. I feel like that's like mm -hmm. kind of the opposite of racist. Yeah, ah! well, look, Nancy Pelosi, if John, John Doyle was here earlier, Nancy Pelosi is Catholic by word only. Yeah. That woman, if she has any sense about her and she would read the word of God, yeah. which is what your whole faith is based on, then you would know that what you've been doing is sinful. Yeah. Okay, killing off millions. Right. Yeah, I fully I, agree with both of you on this. I just, I think I should at least add that your Pelosi is disturbingly accurate. <laughs> it's so good. It's, it makes me uncomfortable. It was, it was the best. That was, it's so good. One of the best I've ever heard. Well, so I go. <laughs> when you're committed, it's incredible. I go in my dressing room and I just down vodka before oh. I, before I come on to do the impression, and then I just nail it. I, I thought that was a large water bottle, but apparently, apparently not. It wasn't water, Stu. Thank you guys both for. Thank being you. here. Thank you for watching uh, and we will see you guys tomorrow. <laughs>